Hi everybody, it is me, Mr. X Stitch here, uh, with a quick floss tube video, I think. There's a lot going on, right, the first thing you need to know is Flora's asleep upstairs in my window, I've been able to talk to you guys tiny, and if I've learnt anything in the past two weeks since I became daily daycare three days a week is that, yeah, getting stuff done is a bit of a challenge. Now, don't get me wrong, like, hanging out with Flora is the best thing ever. Uh, it just means that I have to work at weird times of the week and know that I will never really get anything done properly ever again. I just wanted to give you a little rundown of what's been going on lately because there's been some groovy things. So I had the knitting and stitching show which was at Olympia and that ran from the 1st to the 4th of March and we had just four days of people coming and hanging out. I was very blessed to have the degree students of the Royal School of Needlework teaching cross-stitched people and they were really helpful. Some of them came along on the Wednesday and helped me set up the exhibition. The exhibition itself looked really good. We had, you know, pieces I showed you online from like the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s and we had modern things like the work of Crapistry. We had Keith Clark with his amazing uh, massive pinboard Elvis picture which was really brilliant and up close it just looked like shades of grey X's but from a distance it was Elvis and people could see it from the restaurant and the entrance to the show so that was really groovy uh, and Keith had also done four pieces based on the characters of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air which were stitched onto jackets so we had those hanging up as well. We had a really nice mix of pieces and we had some other work from Met Stitch magazine as well and then yeah table set out and people learning to cross stitch for four days they were learning to cross stitch my um, Christmas bauble project which I've got yet to do a video about or do any serious promotion about but basically if you're on the inside track if you go to mrxstitch.com forward slash bauble you can find out about it there. In a nutshell I'm doing a collaborative art project uh, it's part of an installation that will be a national trust property at the end of the year and I'm trying to crowdsource Christmas baubles from people. So if you want to get ahead of the game go to mrxstitch.com forward slash bauble you can download the pattern which has got four different designs and you can stitch it whichever way you want uh, and the instructions of where to send it to so get cracking on those it'd be brilliant hopefully I'll just get hundreds of baubles but I will do a proper video about that at some point soon. So yeah, we had the knitting and stitching show and that was really cool and now I'm in this position where I have to like slowly pack everything back up, send it back from whence it came and all those sorts of things. But it was a great opportunity, met some lovely people, really nice to see a few people from YouTube on there as well, to be honest. So uh, that was cool. Um, yeah, and it's just a real blessing, you know, four days, <laughs> it's really hard on right because it can be quite tiring. You know, you do, the Thursday is from 10 in the morning till 7.30 at night and then Fridays. 10 till 5.30, Saturday 10 till 5.30, Sunday 10 till 5. And it's a lot of standing around and talking and stuff like that. And it can be a bit taxing, but it's really hard to complain about because you're like, oh, it's very tiring talking to people who are interested in what I have to say and think I'm cool. So <laughs> it's like, it gets a bit tiring, but it's a real blessing. It's a real pleasure to meet so many enthusiastic people who love stitching and to just you know, inspire them, chat to them, find out about them, see familiar faces and all those sorts of things. Um, yeah, good times indeed. Then, last week, last week was the first week of me doing three days a week daily daycare. So that kind of threw everything up in the air, but it was really cool and I think I've got a grip with that and I feel like me and Flora have bonded a bit more and that's really groovy. Um, then on the Saturday, I got to go down to London uh, where I appeared on national radio. I was on BBC Radio 4, which is like the most highbrow of all our radio stations. Radio 3 is pretty highbrow, but that's more like classical music. Radio 4 is a lot of plays and comedy and, you know, good listening, really. On Saturday morning, they have a show called Saturday Live, which is like their chat show. And I got to go down there because of my forthcoming TV appearance, which I'll talk about another time. Uh, although, to be honest, if I don't get another video out in time, Wednesday 28th of March, BBC 4, 9pm, you'll get to see me teaching cross-stitch. It's a show called Make Craft Britain. You definitely want to check it out. It's a three-part series. It's really good, actually. There's some really nice workshops going on. So if you're into craft, you want to see some craft on telly, keep an eye out for it, BBC 4. I don't know how you watch it internationally, but where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and if you like it, make sure you make lots of noise about it, because the more craft programmes, you know, the more response they get to craft programmes, the better it is. So I've got a groovy official image here. Hopefully I'll be able to talk about that in a forthcoming video, uh, all being well, but yeah, if I don't manage to get that in time, 28th of March is when I'll be on, it's quality. Um, yeah, so I got to go down to Radio 4 
and basically uh, I was there alongside a lady called Katie Piper who's a philanthropist now. She was a victim of a horrific acid attack and has had over 200 operations. She lost the sight in one eye. I think she lost the eye. Um, but she does a lot of work to kind of promote people who've suffered similar circumstances and you know redefining the idea of beauty. She's a really like a really amazing woman you know she's gone through a horrendous event and has come through out the other side. She's a mother of two now she does a lot of work she was working really hard that day doing all kinds of things so she was there there was a guy called Clive England who uh, he was a listener to the show and he was 57 and had recently met his birth mother uh, he was a doctor from birth and he kind of told the story of that. Um, there's a lady called Kemi Alcott who's a downhill skier and a TV commentator and she's probably one of the UK's most well-known, well, most decorated downhill skiers. She was really nice. And then they had a wise guy called Mr. X Stitch. Um, the show was presented by Susie Klein who's a Radio 3 presenter. Lovely voice, really nice person. Just started cross-stitching. And uh, the Reverend Richard Coles who... Um, is quite well known. He used to be in a band called the Communards and he's a vicar in Northamptonshire but he does a lot of telly and stuff like that. So and it was a really good experience. We went down there, the show was live from nine in the morning until ten thirty. Very relaxed atmosphere. Uh, we talked around the houses and stuff like that. Now they do a podcast version of it. I've downloaded the podcast so what I'm going to do for you shortly is play the bit that I'm in. The problem is it's, it's audio so I'm just going to put a couple of pictures up um, I showed a couple of pieces of work. Uh, I took some pieces in with me, um, a bauble that I've been working on for Flora. And then I talked about, and I talk about it in the show, how I uh, had some personal issues a couple of years ago and I decided to cross stitch the stages of grief. Uh, the five stages of grief are denial, anger, negotiation, depression, and acceptance. And I started out with the first two. And by the time I got to the end of anger, things had improved. I'm not saying there was a direct link between the two, it's sort of a bit of counselling and stuff like that, but definitely I didn't feel the need that I needed to move on with them. So, um, but yeah, I brought those along with me. They were very nice talking about those sorts of things. So, so what I'll do is I'll I'll play a bit of the audio and then uh, I'll put a couple of images over the top. Uh, I'll try and work out how long it is going to be in the film so that you can just spin forward to the end of it if you get tired of listening to me. But Long story short, it was a fantastic opportunity. I had this weird situation afterwards, right, where I've run out of data on my phone, so I couldn't really get any messages other than text messages. And I actually spent three and a half hours on trains around London because I had to go and buy a backpack for Flora or collect one that we bought on eBay. And so I went from the centre of London to Wimbledon, and then I had to go from Wimbledon to Rickmansworth, and weekend traffic being what it was, I had to get a train and bus and a train and another train and another train and another train. So I spent like, spent like three and a half hours on trains with no messages from anybody about how I was getting on because everyone was WhatsApping me and stuff. So it's quite surreal, really. But it was a really good day. I really enjoyed it. I had a lovely opportunity. I had lovely feedback from people. Apparently, I didn't sound like a pillock, so that was all good. And yeah, we'll see what happens. I had some interesting emails from people off the back of that. So that was the national radio experience anyway. And then, like I say, in two weeks' time, I've got a national telly experience, and we'll see what happens uh, from that. It's been really interesting to see and there's part of me that hopes that other things can come from it you know I was on the telly back in 2011 I think it was and I got quite excited and thought oh this is the beginning of an amazing telly career and what I've learned is that TV companies particularly when it comes to craft you have to wait for the channels to go we want more craft programs so that then the TV companies that produce the programs can uh, respond to that need so unless the time is right then you just kick in dirt waiting for it to happen so this time I'm under no illusion that anything else will come from it maybe it will and that will be brilliant the TV company were very positive about those sorts of things and I feel like there's there's definitely plenty of scope for more craft on the telly but we'll just have to see hopefully people will respond really well to it and the BBC and other channels will start to you know there's a couple of other craft programs that have been on in the UK lately so you feel like maybe there's something going on there and I know over in the States totally jealous but I know that uh, Amy Poehler and uh, Nick Offerman are doing like craft based TV shows <laughs> I need to get me some of that um, but yeah we'll wait and see what happens really the show's good, I'm really proud of it. If nothing else comes, it's been another fantastic opportunity and we'll just carry on, but maybe other things will come from it. Who's to say, really? 
so yeah, that's a succinct review of what's been going on in the past couple of weeks or whatever. Uh, I realise now with my new schedule of daddy daycare, plus trying to get the magazine out, plus trying to do all these other things, that maybe a fortnightly video is about as good as I can muster at the moment. But uh, I've definitely got plans afoot for YouTube. I just have to tidy up a load of other things in the first place. Uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to this. Uh, I welcome your thoughts and comments. If you enjoy listening to the audio, uh, that'd be great. Let me know what you think. If you know of any TV channels that need a kingpin of embroidery to be part of their show, you know, you know where to find me. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, and yeah, I look forward to your comments and I'm sure I'll see you next time. So for now, this is me, Mr. X Stitch, kingpin of contemporary embroidery, signing out. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Now, um, you might not really assume that the best way to assuage nicotine cravings is to take up embroidery, but the prospect of a long-haul flight set Jamie Chalmers thinking about how to beat the no-smoking cravings, and now he's hooked on the stitching, not the smoking, and has restyled himself as Mr X-Stitch. What gave you the idea in the first place that embroidery was the answer? Uh, I went into a haberdashery shop, and I just thought it'd be funny because I'm not a small man, and the idea of people seeing me cross-stitching on a plane, I just thought it might freak them out a little bit. <laughs> uh, and that sponsoring thought was sufficient for me to buy a kit and then eventually have a go at it. And I sort of kind of instantly fell in love with it. And did it work on the flight? I mean, like, thing one, did it work with the cravings? Did it calm you down? Did oh, you totally. find a zen-like state of bliss? Yeah, I mean, I, I ended up doing it on the flight on the way back, but I always, whenever I'm flying or going on a train, I always take cross-stitch. And a pro tip is, if you're on a long-haul flight, if the cabin crew are where you're a cross-stitcher, you're more interesting than the average, <laughs> which means it speeds up your gin and tonic return time because <laughs> oh. they want to see how you're getting on. It's a win-win. You get a it cushion is. and extra G&Ts at the end of it. If you want a, a space on a train, by yourself be a man doing cross stitch because people won't sit near you because they don't know what's going on on a dog collar you'll get the compartment to yourself yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. so how do the needles get through security needles are you fine you can do it yeah. i've discovered this you can knit on hey, a plane confession. yes you do it on planes too i started cross stitching because i am really claustrophobic i hate going on planes i had a 14 hour flight to argentina and i thought i'm going to try embroidery because mm. I suddenly found online that you can you can knit online uh, on a plane. You can take tiny sewing scissors. You can take little needles. There's really specific stuff you're allowed to do. Yeah, the blade length on your scissors is the only real issue where they have to be under four centimeters. But you can even get things like thread cutters and stuff to get around that. But it's so it is so relaxing. It passes the time. I on a, a flight back from Chicago once. I ended up sitting next to a guy, and by the end of the flight, he was cross stitching. <laughs> I sort of give him my work. So it was over time, over like eight hours, he just become more curious. About do you what think that was just to get you to stop? talking about cross stitching <laughs> it might have been it's the song i sing when i'm stitching that is off putting i think um you have this i like the pretty butch name for an embroiderer how yeah. long did it take you to come up with mr x stitch i came up with that in 2008 it's kind of spawned from comic books and all those sorts of things i mean i get called mr cross stitch a lot because people just do and i'm kind of fine with that but i'm a little bit like ideally a bit edgier than that you know i've got <laughs> tattoos with x's on and all those sorts of things um yeah, it's just that kind of counterculture approach. Okay, and the menace it, of a short bladed scissor as well. I was going to say, I've it's not some... the immediate place that you go for counterculture embroidery. I mean, it, it's a really interesting thing, that sense of historically, it's been something that ladies do, is yeah. little bits of needlework in the corner while they sit quietly. Yeah. Was, was being a bloke who did embroidery part of the appeal for you and how much have you had conversations with with people about that well there's no denying that there, i mean as katie was saying we get told stories about society you know and, and ladies doing stitching is one of those stories so as a man who stitched i did go through a bit of a personal process in terms of being comfortable with it and all those sorts of things but it's also part of my usp you know i'm not what you expect from a cross stitcher so i disable your preconceptions in the first place which means then i can show you what an amazing world cross stitch is because it is amazing there's so much interesting stuff out there so it's just a means to an end and as you said katie like when you start looking at the stories we're told and and going against those stories all kinds of things spin up you know i'm i'm not averse to a bit of flower arranging you know all of those kind of things i think <laughs> tricky it's good on the to plane. change them <laughs> <laughs> tricky on the plane, yeah, very much so yeah true. so um 
I mean, in history, you look back and there are people, I didn't realise people like William Morris used mm. to apparently cross stitch with his family. It was it was at some point a male thing to do. We just sort of forgot about yeah. that somewhere along the line. Yeah, there's a sort of divergence, I think, um, between, you know, men and art and women and craft. And it was kind of... A thing happened once where I think I was at the Ashmolean and I was looking at some textiles and a penny dropped and I realised that by being a guy in the 21st century who's into cross-stitch, I'd meandered into a socio-political <coughs> discourse that's been going on for centuries because it was used as a tool to put women in their place. It's not a very exciting thing to watch. And so if you've got an image of a woman embroidering, you can go sit in the corner, you know, and you can play that kind of story. And that's kind of what happened. And then marketing forces have meandered along and, and kind of reiterated those points. So now everyone thinks it's countryside's cottages and done by little old ladies, and they couldn't be further from the truth, really. But quite a lot of embroidery was done by convents of nuns in the Middle Ages, which were often women who were quite powerful in their own right, came from elite strata of society, and put a lot of that experience into their work as embroiderers. Yeah, I mean, ecclesiastical embroidery and those sorts of things. And it, it goes on for eons, yeah. And when you look back, I was doing a thing called the Knitting and Stitching Show at Olympia last weekend, and we had a piece there for a Manida worker from 1771. And sublime embroidery, you know, it has been around a long time. And it was, you know, you spin back 500 years and the gender discourse wasn't part of the issue. But so when you're at the conventions now, the Knitting and Stitching conventions, yeah. what sort of stuff, what are the big trends that we should be looking out for? What kind of things are people doing? Uh... Well, I mean, it's it's very diverse. If you go onto you know social media like Instagram or something, and you do a few searches for particular X stitch and stuff, you'll see all kinds of counterculture things, hip hop lyrics references. It's quite a lot of should we say fruity language? A nice floral embroidery with a bit of fruity language is a popular combo. <laughs> That's a big thing now, isn't it? I've noticed that a lot because it's quite startling because you see a, a sort of beautifully embroidered rose and you think, oh, nice, and then a comment underneath which seems to come from the other end of the garden, if I can yeah, put it that way. Yeah, I think we all go through that as part of our cross-stitching journey. Everybody thinks I'm all about the F-bombs and I'm not anymore. Uh, you know, I prefer a good bit of witticism or a bit of a double take or something like that. But those things are a means to an end. And one of the things I did with my website was we would feature rude things and and, you know, adult content because it would say that it's okay for that to happen, you know? Express even, yourself this way. Yeah, even in the Bayo Tapestry, there's a guy with his bits out. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been around a while. Yeah. <laughs> you did not come from a, an arty, crafty background. I think you worked in IT. Mm. And now, I mean, it's not just become a passion this is now your job yeah so how did that happen how did you make that transition it was that it's taken 10 years to get here and i started a website in 2008 which featured contemporary embroidery and needlecraft and i think being on a small island being a guy standing up doing it being slightly ahead of the curve on those sorts of things that definitely got me to the position i am now but i've been able to have opportunities i was on the telly a few years ago i'm going to be on the telly again at the end of the month i've been you know doing various workshops and all those sorts of things and because like sometimes i'm a bit funny as well taking it seriously but not too seriously i think that's been part of the thing because i coined the phrase stitch gasm which is where you see a piece of embroidery and you have a slightly visceral response to it um and i think those kind of things help perpetuate it and just say to people you know it's all right um now i produce a magazine as well a cross stitch pattern magazine uh, which is like self-published and the idea is is it just shows that it can be relevant and edgy and we can have grown-up content and all those sorts of things because again people think cross-stitch patterns are a certain way and while they are and while that's perfectly acceptable cross-stitch is as diverse as the world is really what's your favorite piece that you've ever made uh there's a few so, do you know what some of the little pieces like the first piece i made was always important and i framed it and gave it to my mum the back of it is absolutely atrocious um, I made a piece. I'm so glad the back of yours is atrocious. <laughs> oh, I tell you, there's so much worry about the way the back of the piece should look. And at the end of the day, like as crafters, you always want to be better at your craft, you know. So a tidy back's quite important, but it doesn't matter, you know. I did a small piece of the Mona Lisa. You won't ever see the back of that. It's in a frame, and I'll hunt you down if you want to look for the back of it. Oh, well, so I, I, I got, I did a bit of tapestry when I was living in a monastery for two years because one of the monks was a very good needle person, and he only looked at the backs. Yeah, and he used to discard. Oh, that's I did mean. a. I did a rose, I did a lily, I did a poppy, discarded because of my untidy backs. It tells, I mean, it tells the back of the work. I brought a piece in, you oh, can have a look. It mine's okay. un, they're not untidy because I've put the effort in. But, could you know. I just say that I couldn't tell the difference between the front and the back, <laughs> which to me is the gold standard of brilliant That's embroidery work. It's beautiful. It is lovely. Let me pass it. Um, 
It's the word denial done in a sort of digital graphic style, which yeah. actually goes rather well with cross stitch because you have a grid pattern. Don't you? Yeah, it's pixelation, and that's where you do get a lot of overlap with like old school video games and those kind of things. There's a lot of, uh, and essentially, cross stitch is pixelated. You know, so you can turn any image into a cross stitch. You just have to think about it as tiny squares. That's a tiny technical question. What is cross stitch? Cross stitch is a form of embroidery. It's made of two stitches: a top stitch and a bottom stitch, and it's done on an even weave fabric. Uh, so there's always a sort of X grid. And so, you know, you just end up with this. Technically, it's an X rather than a cross because it's on the 45 degree. But I was going to say it's a skill. The lovely thing for me learning it was it's a skill that you can learn in, what, five minutes, 10 yeah, minutes? Yeah. And then you're off. Best thing ever, I teach workshops all the time and the learning curve is like 10 minutes and then everyone's got a little smile on their face and you can sit around and have a bit of banter and they're making things and stuff. Teenagers, classrooms of teenagers going silent because they're doing cross-stitch. Amazing. But it's not just about banter, is it? I mean, looking at these two beautiful pieces that you've brought in that say anger and denial, um, exquisitely made, uh, there's obviously a sort of therapeutic... Mm aspect to it for you how how has it sort of helped you work through ideas issues yeah i mean i had a couple of issues a few couple of years ago um and decided to stitch the stages of grief because i thought it would be a good thing to do um it ties in with this idea also of craftivism which is doing craft through activism and the idea being that this process takes time and when you're sitting making a thing with a message you get absorbed into that message in a way that maybe you don't with like clicktivism and those sorts of things so I did denial first, and then I did anger. And the other two stage, three stages are negotiation, depression, and acceptance. But kind of by the time I got to the end of anger, things had cleared up a bit. So, I'm holding so you anger. went straight to yeah. closure. Yeah, that was it, yeah. <laughs> I'm holding anger at the moment, and it's wonderful. It's done in a, in a kind of blood-red thread, which, yeah. of course, is the colour of anger. But also it uses that, that, that kind of angledness of the, of the form, produces a sort of feeling of anger to that jagged edge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's the beauty of it. And I think because you sort of, sometimes you can make things up as you go along, so you get a an opportunity to explore colour and shape and all those sorts of things. A lot of people take comfort in following patterns, but just as many people make their own designs these days. Um, it's a great form of expression. They're incredibly beautiful things and um, absolutely worth doing. But, I, I but would... you have an 11-month-old, so my question is, can you do this one-handed, holding the baby, rocking the baby to sleep? I'm just going to say, without the use of a floor stand and various other accoutrements, I'm going to say no to that. But what I would say is, if if you're ah, if you're going to make a thing for Mother's Day, you're a bit late this year, but definitely next year, cross stitch for Mother's Day is absolutely bang on. But two hands preferred. Two yeah. hands preferred. And what about? I mean, I'm of an age now where I, my eyesight's not great, mm. and I would worry. But you can. You can have intense light, you can have a magnifying medium, all sorts of things make yeah, it possible. Yeah, all the gubbins, yeah. I'm quite interested in getting some of those, uh, like, jewellery glasses, so I can just be like, <gasps> and just drop the little lenses over and those sorts of They're things. They're like night vision goggles, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, with the little torches on the side and those sorts of things. There's a load of gizmos out there these days, but... Um, yeah, and I mean, even, you know, if eyesight is an issue, you can get tapestry on canvas so it's bigger and it's easier to stitch with and those sorts of things. Katie, you spent a lot of time recovering in hospital from your injuries. I don't know if you were able to help what good nick your hands were in, but what did you do to kind of pass those endless hours? Um, it was actually down to my mum because I obviously lost my eyesight in both eyes initially. So my mum would read to me. Um, and I would just listen to her and sometimes I would fall asleep to her just reading to me in, you know, obviously sleep helps healing and it would, it would sort of be a comfort. And she was reading a load of rubbish, you know, picking out those take a break type magazines from the waiting room. <laughs> and she'd read sometimes the same magazine three, four times every single bit. But it was just hearing like the... Yeah rhythmic sound of a familiar voice because when you shut your eyes you feel really vulnerable when you can't see and you know not being born blind and suddenly being blinded it's a really vulnerable feeling so yeah it was was quite reassuring hearing her read and as you recovered your sight and your agility did you kind of take on extra things as sort of physiotherapy or as mental um i think a big i mean still now i'm blinds in my left eye so my I, I drive so watch out <laughs> uh, quite quite badly but um I mean a therapy that really really helped me besides you know traditional therapy was exercise yeah. and I think that was to do with low moods and you know depression anxiety releasing those endorphins but also a sense of uh, being in control of one's own body because when you have to surrender to medical treatment you lose all that control and you know you're uncertain of the possible outcome if I go and run 5k i'm in control and i'm pretty certain of the possible outcome so that's something that's really helped me and shemi are you a, a crafty person i mean your whole life was sort of geared towards this super elite physical status the the lovely thing about 
art slash craft is that it, it's not measured in that way. But are you were right about downhillers, that. Actually, downhillers. We were just talking about this because um, I'm I'm big into crochet. Yeah. And we used to sit there when you'd have a two hour course stop because there was too much wind and there was a start delay. Everyone at the start, we used to make little headbands for each other, um, and it was a real good way of distraction, but positive distraction. You feel like you're doing something. You've got that kind of not mind numbing just escapism <laughs> taking yourself away from the fact you're about to ski 90 miles an hour down a mountain and something could happen and um yeah so crochet which apparently is a no-no when i said no. to you that i did crochet you kind of <laughs> looked oh, down no. at me could we not get into craft wars <laughs> and hierarchy here let's we're all among friends by the way if you would like to try some of this for yourself there is a uh, the get creative festival it runs from the 17th of march until the 25th you can find out all about the events they're all listed on the bbc arts website which is bbc.co.uk slash art if you you are a fan of slow TV of the BBC Four variety, you will love Make! Exclamation mark, Craft Britain. Uh, it's a three-part doc series. The joy of making things by hand, it starts on BBC Four on the 21st of March. That exclamation mark's a bit intense. Don't you find? I, it's not my choice. I'd have just done Make for Make stock. in capital <laughs> letters, <laughs> exclamation mark. Cross stitch, Jamie. Could it have been black and white work? Could it have been tapestry? Why cross stitch? Um, I think there's a simplicity to cross stitch of all of the, the embroideries out there. And there's some beautiful things, you know, there's silk shading, there's gold work, there's Japanese embroidery, which is like ninja level embroidery. But cross stitch has this simplicity that it's two stitches, it's repetitive, it's easy, and it's a skill that can last you forever. And I think that because it's almost like all you have to do is count what you're following, that deepens this sensation of like mindfulness and in the moment that you get. Because it is really, as you were saying, it's like it can take your mind off things. I sometimes will sit with a notebook to, the, to my side and if I'm doing some stitching, allow the other ideas to bubble to the surface and I can write them down because it's totally got that mindfulness thing. Mindfulness. We get a lot of that on this programme now. Yeah. Big thing. Well, this is Saturday Live, Ever Mindful, with Susie Klein and Richard Coles. We're joined in the studio by Alpine Ski Racer, Shemi Alcott, by Paradigm Shifting in. Embroidier, Mr. Embroidier, Embroidier, Mr. X Stitch, by Clive England, who rounded up his birth family in the United States, and Katie Piper, who's been telling us what's in her head. We're going to hear a bit more of that in a moment, more from everybody. In fact, we have inheritance tracks too from Jeremy Vine. First, the news with Charles Carroll. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, please like the video down below. If you uh, feel like you're interested in what I have to say, please subscribe to my channel. That'll be great. Uh, there'll be another video here for your viewing pleasure of something else that I have to say. And until next time, this is your boy, Mr. X Stitch, signing off. Love ya. Bye.